My name is Zach Thompson, and I am on staff here at Calvary. It is, uh, it has been really good to be able to rotate to the other campuses to go to Boulder. Last week was in Erie, but there's nothing like coming back home. So glad to be with you all uh, again. Uh, and, and it was so strange going to those campuses. Can you believe what those weirdos do? They sit in the front row. What? It was the strangest thing I've ever seen. But glad to be back here. We are wrapping up our series in Beyond Blue, where we see that this is a time of particular hurt. There's a lot going on right now that fills us with pain, with despondency, with, with, with so much anguish. These, these emotions that we would have never wished for ourselves. It's also a particular season of hurt. This time of year, we wrap up one year where we had goals that weren't met, expectations that that, uh, didn't get accomplished, and now we have to muster the courage to dream for this year as well, and that's hard to do, especially after multiple tough years in a row, and this has had an impact on us. And so we've been looking at the stories that God gives us in His Word of those who hurt like us, who cry like us, who scream like us, who worry like us, and who doubt like us. One of my favorite people in the Bible is John the Baptist. God spoke through so many incredible men and women in the Old Testament, and yet people continued to turn away from God, refusing to listen to God's voice. And we get to a point where God actually stops speaking. But then he breaks his silence in the New Testament. He speaks to John's parents, he speaks to Jesus' parents, and then he speaks through John himself. And people stop and take notice. There is something different about this man. And I don't just mean that he was wearing weird clothes and eating bugs. No, people see his boldness his unwavering following of what God is calling him to do, his denial of himself, denying so much that that he could have had to follow God in this special way, and people flock to him. He also goes toe-to-toe with the religious leaders at the time. He, He shows them where they are more interested in acquiring authority and abusing authority than using it how God instructs them to, and people come and listen to him until he gets to the point where his boldness, his unwavering following of God actually gets him thrown into jail. But he knows his role. He's not the guy, but he points to the guy. His job isn't to to make things right. His job was to show people their sins, but one is coming after him who will hold every person accountable. You can throw me in jail, Herod Antipas, you evil man, but Jesus has come. This is how John announced Jesus back in Matthew chapter 3. If, if you want to turn over with me there, we'll, we'll come back to Matthew 11, so don't lose that yet. But in Matthew chapter 3, Jesus is talking to these religious leaders, and he's saying this one who is to come after him, this one that we know is Jesus, Matthew chapter 3 verse 12 says this, his winnowing fork, he is harvesting, his winnowing fork is in his hand, he will clear the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, he will bring people close to himself, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. John is looking for the day when those who go against God will be met with justice, where this world will have righteousness rewarded and sins will be judged. And yet John is still sitting in prison. And Herod Antipas is still sleeping with his brother's wife. And Jesus isn't doing anything about that. So doubts start to creep in. Flip back to to Matthew 11, to the passage that that Sharon read for us earlier. Matthew 11, verse 2. Now when John, John the Baptist, heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples, and he said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Jesus, I had put my trust in you, but you aren't doing anything that I expected you to do. Jesus, I did my part. I was faithful, and now I'm facing punishment, not reward. Jesus, I baptized you. When are you going to keep your end of the bargain? You're supposed to baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. 
Jesus, when I got arrested, not only did you not do anything about it, you left town. You bailed on me. Maybe you weren't the one that I was expecting after all. Doubts start to creep in, which was once belief is now being questioned. Where there was boldness, it's now hesitancy as doubts are creeping in, as he is no longer as bold, he's no longer believing in the way that he used to. Now, we might say John's in jail, and spoiler alert, he's uh, on death row, actually. Uh, Doubts, of course, are only natural. Anyone is going to have questions about what got them to that place, but this is John the Baptist. This is this one who, who God spoke through after years of silence. He has denied himself to follow God in this special way. Jesus himself describes him uh, this way in Matthew eleven eleven. He says, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Pretty high praise coming from Jesus. John is this one who the Old Testament has been building up to. He's this promised one announcing the Messiah. Jesus says, of those born of women, there is no one greater than John the Baptist. John looks at your world's greatest boss mug and laughs because his says world's greatest human. And yet that guy had doubts. He had doubts. One of the most difficult things is when we're going through hardship or suffering is we're never just going through that thing. The pain that we're experiencing is not the extent of our difficulties. John's problem was not just that he was in jail. As we're going through pain and suffering and of all that attacks our mental and physical and spiritual and emotional health, we always add to it. People can't understand or relate to what we're going through or they can no longer be around us because we just seem to constantly talk about this pain that we're feeling because it's all that exists to us. And, And now they're leaving and we add isolation to our list of problems. We have expectations that we put on ourselves or onto others, but when those aren't met, we now add disappointment to our list of things that we're experiencing. Times of hurt are often a wound to our pride because we couldn't stop it. We couldn't do anything to make sure this didn't happen. Things were more out of control than we realized or than we cared to admit. And in times like this, doubts seep in as well. You see, doubt finds us when times are hard. Doubt finds us when times are hard. We see that in the life of John the Baptist who goes from boldness to bindings, from the Jordan to jail, from prophet to prisoner. And as he goes through this time, as he's going through this difficulty, he went from announcing Jesus as the Messiah to now wondering, maybe I wasn't right after all. And John is far from the only person in the Bible to have doubts find him when times are hard. I think of Abraham, God says, I will make you into this great nation, but how is that possible when I don't have a single child? Maybe God won't do this. Maybe something's wrong, so I'll have a a son with this woman who's not my wife. And how he responds to doubt actually makes things worse. Moses has been gone up the mountain for 40 days. Clearly something is wrong, and so doubt leads to a golden calf. Samuel was supposed to be here seven days ago, but he's not, and the people are now leaving. Saul is king. He has to do something, and he breaks the command from God. He offers a sacrifice himself, and fear and doubt lead to the downfall of his reign as king. Doubt finds us when times are hard, and it's truly horrific that we have this this mentality in churches that we have to pretend like things are fine, that we have to not ask these questions, we have to not reveal that we're struggling with thoughts about God. Oh, you can't say that about God. It's a problem because, first of all, it proves that we don't read our Bibles because doubts are all over the pages of Scripture. But second, it removes us from the ability to help each other because doubts are all over God's people now as well. We ask questions. We make statements. Is God 
really good? Does God really care? Is he who he says he is? How long are you going to keep allowing this? How long are you going to keep permitting this to happen? I thought God would have fixed all of this by now, but clearly he's not interested in that. Why, God, why? And when doubts are left unattended, they grow. More questions are added. They become bigger and bigger. We add anxiety and fear, eventually getting to a place that some would call a crisis of faith, where doubts can get to the point where they shake and shatter our whole world, our belief system, our identity. So how great is it that Jesus does not leave John in his doubts? His question was, are you the one? Well, this is how Jesus responds in verse 4. And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended because of me. Doubt found John when times were hard. He, like all of us, judged God based off of the circumstances of his life. And so Jesus says, as a response, am I the one? We'll look at all that is happening. And he points to these, these acts, these miracles that he's doing. And, and the Old Testament said the Messiah would do these things. So in a way, he's answering his question, but he's actually doing more than that. John was looking for the day when justice would be brought to this world, and that wasn't happening according to him. But Jesus is saying, look at what is happening. These acts are done to undo some of the evil the pain, the brokenness of this world. John, I've come and I'm making all things new. Doubt finds us when times are hard and left unattended doubts can grow. They can fill us full of despondency. They can, they can fill us full of so much fear in this life. They can strip us of all hope, all that we believe in. And when doubts are as, are, can be as big as... Uh, can be in something as big as the person and work of Jesus will completely shatters our world around us. So the question is, why is there doubt? If doubt could be so damaging to us, why doesn't the Holy Spirit have with him some sort of doubt blocker to stop all this? Why do doubts exist? Well, doubts exist because we have been made curious and discerning. Curious, God's given us this incredible world to explore and in the process know more about Him. We get to grow closer to God as our curiosity takes us towards Him. Discernment, we come across things that are good and bad for us and to know what is good and to choose that. But we run into issues when our curiosity creates insufficient hypotheses in the times that we falsely discern that our circumstances do not align with God's will or God's character which is just a really convoluted way of saying doubt finds us when times are hard and we don't know how to explain it. But doubt can be good. Doubt helps me know what is true when I get a call and I hear a robotic voice on the other line and it's someone who wants to talk to me about my car's extended warranty. Joke's on you, bud. I can't afford an extended warranty. <laughs> doubt helps us arrive to the truth that an alien did not take the last cookie with its tractor beam, despite the child with crumbs all over his face telling us that's what they saw happen. Doubt helps me know what to do when I receive my about weekly email from Pastor Tom saying, hey, can you go out and buy me a bunch of gift cards? But I'm in a meeting right now, so don't call me about it. Just respond to this email. Uh, but it's interesting because the email's not coming from calvarybible.com, and I've gotten them when in a meeting with Tom before. And proper doubt can actually drive us towards God. Doubt allows us to strip away beliefs that we hold about him that aren't true, things that we, we've thought about him but actually aren't who God says that he is. Doubt helps us to remove these parts, these things that we hold about God that aren't true. Doubt can be a good thing. I really like how Charles Spurgeon put it. He says that the heart that has never doubted has not yet learned to believe. As the farmers say, the land that will not grow a thistle will not grow wheat. In other words, it is far more dangerous to not have doubts about God than to have doubts about God. 
Well, why is that? Well, doubt reveals a mind that is trying to grow closer to him in alignment with him to reconcile this broken world with a perfect God. If we don't have doubts about him, we might not have thoughts about him. And doubts can strip away, as I said, these, these insufficient thoughts of him. Doubts can remove things that we've held from tradition or experience that we thought were true of him. And as we are pursuing truth, it is driving us to the God who is truth. So it's not doubt that forces us away from it. It's not doubt that causes us to make rash decisions. It's how we respond to doubt that makes all the difference. So how do we do it? When doubt finds us, when times are hard, how do we respo- respond to these doubts? Well, the first way we, we respond to doubt is we don't doubt alone. We don't doubt alone. In the times that we say, you can't say that about God, you can't ask these questions, you can't uh, look anything other than the perfect Christian, what we're actually doing is actively driving people towards despair. And so find people, get in a group, talk to men or women older than yourself to see how God has worked through their doubts, because here's the thing, they've had doubts before. Find someone who helps you realize that you aren't going through this alone. Don't doubt alone. Second way we, we respond is we remind ourselves of how God has worked in our lives in the past, how he's worked throughout human history, and we celebrate that. And the times that we ask the questions, is God really good? Well, how has God shown his goodness to you before? Does God even care? Well, how has God demonstrated his love in your life before? And this is so hard to do when we're experiencing doubt, when, when our pains just seem to fill every crevice of our being. And so what was step one again? We don't doubt alone. In the times that it's so difficult to remember and celebrate what God has done, when, in the times where it's not so easy to recall the person and work of Jesus, well, that's when we need others to come alongside of us and help lighten the load. Similar to that, we fill ourselves with truth. When we ask the question, is God who he says that he is? Well, we need to remind ourselves of who God says that he is. When we experience doubts, that's the time to read our Bibles more and not less. As we uh, oftentimes are doubting something that's not actually true about God, we need to go back to who God says that he is to remind ourselves of who he is, to see were we doubting him or something that we thought was him, to strip away these bad thoughts, these insufficient ideas that we've had of him. C.S. Lewis says this on a different topic, but I I think it relates really well. He says, uh, this is why daily prayers and religious reading and church going are necessary parts of the Christian life. We have to be continually reminded of what we believe. We have to be continually reminded of what we believe, just in case you didn't get it the first time. Neither this belief nor any other will automatically remain alive in the mind it must be fed. That is true at all times. That is especially true when we are in doubt. We respond by going slow. Maybe we hear the story of John the Baptist and we get a little bit angry. He expressed his doubts to Jesus and he gets a response. Maybe not the response he was hoping for, but man, must be nice to get something. Because rarely, bordering on never, are our doubts resolved overnight. Instead, it's years or feels like years of pursuing after God. And this is why I take great comfort in the story of Thomas, perhaps the Bible's most famous doubter. He is told by these other disciples that Jesus is alive. He has been resurrected. And and Thomas says, unless if I see and touch the wounds, I will never believe. Such a strong statement there. And then we like to jump to the end of the story where he does get to do those things and he believes and it's all wonderful and beautiful, but we we skip a detail that's given to us in John chapter 20. It says eight days later. Thomas says that, and then eight days later, Jesus appears to him. And sure, we're like, eight days, that's, that's, I've waited longer than for, for like burgers to, uh, before that. And so it's not very long at all, but that must have felt like an eternity. 
eight days of being surrounded by people saying Jesus is alive and not believing that to be true. Eight days of people worshiping a risen Messiah and you still think that he's dead. This guy that you followed for three years is gone. How can they be so happy? Eight days of feeling like the odd one out. And when Jesus does come, there's no shame, there's no condemnation, there's no, why didn't you just believe harder? No, it's now Thomas knows Jesus better than he did before because he's gone through this time of doubt. And gets us to our last way of how we respond. We don't doubt alone. We remember and celebrate. We fill ourselves with truth. We go slow. And we remember that doubt is not the end. Doubt is not the end. It's not the opposite of belief. We have a word for that. And that word is unbelief. It's not doubt. Doubt doesn't prove that we are lacking in faith, but it might just prove that we are growing in it. Because oftentimes, doubt follows a cyclical pattern where we are asking these questions, but we are being brought right back to the God that we are questioning, knowing him better than we did before. Doubt's not the end. In fact, when we are going through it, it adds us to a long line of doubters. Abraham, John the Baptist, Spurgeon, at least deserving to ever be included in a list with those three, me. Every time there's some new difficulty that comes up, I'm, I'm asking the same questions. I'm making the same statements about God that I did the last time there was pain and the time before that and the time before that and the time before that. And I can keep going if you haven't gotten the idea yet. And all of us do. Doubt finds us when times are hard, but how grateful are we to have a God who is bigger than our doubts? How grateful are we to have people in our lives who can help us in these moments? How grateful are we to have an unwavering hope because it's not built on our efforts, it's not built on how strong we believe, on how good of a Christian that we appear to be, but it's a hope that is built on the Jesus who John doubted, who Thomas doubted, who I have doubted, who everyone has doubted, and yet he faithfully came to seek and save the lost, the doubter. Doubt finds us when times are hard, and there are certainly plenty that is hard right now. And so we want to address those doubts. But we also find ourselves in a particular time of doubt. There are more and more stories or more and more publicized stories or uh, maybe more stories that are hitting close to home of people doubting to the point of walking out the doors of a church. There's a movement going on that's been broadly called deconstruction, where this word actually takes on probably more meaning than, than it ought to. Just talk about anyone who's walking out the doors of a church. People might think of the horror stories that we tell. This person grew up in the church, then they went away to college, they took one class, and now they don't believe anything they used to believe. I'm not making light of that. We might know people who've gone through that, but statistically, that's not the reason why people are leaving the church. It, it occurs, sure, but it's, it's a relatively rare reason. Instead, we see people leave church because of a desire to sin, and that's certainly been true at all times. God gives us a way to live that's good and, and for our benefits, but there's always that question. There's always that doubt of, is it really though? Because this other thing looks good, and I think I'd rather have that. And we follow in the footsteps of our ancestors, Adam and Eve, who started a desire to go against God's commands with a doubt. Did God really say? We see people leave the church because of being hurt by Christians or people that they care about, whether an individual or an entire group of people being hurt by Christians. And certainly some of this is, is not fair or warranted, but we have to be honest that church history is full of some awful moments. And the church is currently going through some truly awful moments. There are abuses of just about every kind. There are some churches that are clearly misusing their nonprofit status. There are some churches that are clearly preying on people. And what we see is this is what all churches are like, is the accusation that's made. And people don't go. 
And we see people leave church because the brokenness of this world goes far beyond the last two years. How can we go to a place that talks about the goodness of God when all we see is the badness of this world? There are all kinds of reasons why people are leaving the church. But here's the thing. None of those reasons are actually what's meant by deconstruction. Those would be deconversions. People who say, I want nothing to do with God and I want nothing to do with the church. Deconstruction says, I want nothing to do with the church that I experienced. The pain that was caused to me, the hypocrisy that I saw, questions not being allowed, perfection being the, the goal and anything short of that meant something was wrong with you. These experiences that's been felt in the church are leading some to question, what is it that I believe about God? Because the church that I experienced did not reflect that, or at least what I thought that I believed about him. And doubt plays a role into both of these, in deconversion and deconstruction. And so our steps might still be helpful if, if we're going through this or if we know someone going through this. Don't doubt alone. Remember and celebrate. Fill yourself with truth. Go slow. And remember, doubt's not the end. But these steps assume that it's someone who's willing to be surrounded by other Christians, and that's not something that we can assume with someone going through deconversion or deconstruction. That pain might be more impactful than a desire to be around other Christians. That experience might uh, prohibit someone from walking through the doors of a church again. So we might need some other remedies if we're going to help people going through this. And the first thing that I would give, if we know someone going through either of these experiences, the first thing that we could do to help them is to listen. We don't know why someone has walked out the doors of a church. It could be doubt arising from pain. It could be doubt from a, a painful church experience. It could be doubt because they want nothing to do with God. And if we come at someone with apologetics, with answering the questions of Christianity, and yet they're struggling with God's goodness, or they're struggling with abuse from a church leader, we're probably going to cause more harm than good. So we need to listen. The church can grow so much in its impact in society and people's lives if we just did a better job of listening to people's hurts and pains and doubts. Did questions allow uh, so much that's good to happen. Questions are good for our benefit, for the person's benefit, for, for the church's benefit. Questions make sure that we are staying on mission and not wavering from it. Questions stop abuse in its tracks. Questions allow us to offer help that's actually help. So when we see someone going through these, these steps, deconversion, deconstruction, doubt of any kind, the first thing that we do is we listen. And the second thing that we do is we listen. Probably all the way up to step eight that we do is we listen. And all the while reminding ourselves that doubt is not the end. That God has not left this person. That he's working in their life. That the prayer always is that doubt follows that common path of being cyclical, of leading people back to him with a better understanding of who he is than before. But this can be a particularly worrying time for parents or, or grandparents. What if my child or grandchild abandons everything they once believed in? What if they leave the church and never come back? And while we're never guaranteed that, that our children will follow in our footsteps of faith, I do think that there are some preemptive steps that we could take for when the doubts do come and they will come. So I, I just have a series of, of questions for us to take inventory of. And the first question is this, is Christ compelling in your household? Is the joy that we experience from him on display, is the hope that we receive from him something that's relied on in your home or is Christianity just something that's assumed? Is it a set of rules to follow? Is it something that is even there at all? How can we paint a picture of Jesus that will outlast the pull towards other things? As those questions come of, of, is this better? Or this statement of, I would rather have that. How can we show the magnificence and glory and love of Jesus in a way that outlasts all other things? 
Let me give just one practical example of this. LifeWay did a study a few years back uh, looking at those who uh, left the home but remained in church. What, what were some traits or characteristics that they saw common amongst that group of people? And the primary one that they saw was a habit of Bible reading. So are you teaching your child to read the Bible? I don't have time to make this point, let alone to give practical examples of how to do this. So uh, let me just say that, that Dakota in kids ministry and Brody in student ministries wakes up every single day just wishing you would ask for help on how to do this, how to help your child read the Bible for themselves. So ask them afterwards, tune me out for the rest of this if you haven't done that already and email them right now and just say, how can we do this? Because it has to start in the home. So why we're doing spiritual parenting. Next month on February 13th, 20th, and 27th, we're saying, how can we put this picture of Jesus on display in houses? How can we show Christ in such a compelling way to this next generation that it will outlast even the strongest of doubts? So if you haven't signed up for spiritual parenting, please do. This is a resource to do exactly this for when doubts do come. Another question I have then is, is church compelling in your household? Is this seen as a place of worship, to recharge, to be in community? Is it a beacon of light in a dark, dark world, or is it just something that we do? We hear this weird guy talk for way too long, and then we get to go to lunch. That when something else comes up on a Sunday that that seems more exciting, the first thing to go is church. Where did this generation learn to choose things other than church, ask parents who did their the exact same thing in their childhood. Do your child, does your child know your doubts? Do they know the times that it's been a struggle for you to follow after God, even in difficulty? Or do they just see a fake, perfect picture? And when doubts come for them, which it will, there's a wonder of what's wrong with me, what's wrong with God. I just want to leave us with a final reminder that doubt is not the end. Doubt's not the opposite of belief. Doubt doesn't mean that someone is too far gone, that that there's no hope for them anymore, that when someone was close to Jesus, but now they are far from him, they're just following in the footsteps of John the Baptist who did the same thing. And let's come alongside them like Jesus did to help in their doubts. When we hear people say things about God that's so hurtful, that's so hard to listen about this God that we so love and care for, let's just remind ourselves that they're just repeating the words of Scripture contextualized for their time. And when we see someone who's gone and how heartbreaking it is, let's continue to pray that God will use this time of doubt as he often does, as cyclical, bringing people back to him with a greater understanding than before that doubt would follow the pathway set for us by T.S. Eliot, who said that we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Let me pray for us. Father, we are so grateful that you are bigger than any doubt. The, The act of questioning of wondering, of making statements is not one that disqualifies us from your love. It's not one that shows that you have abandoned us. It's not one that shows that we are too far gone. But instead you provide picture after picture of doubters who come before us, of people in our life who've gone through the same thing or something similar and can help come alongside of us, of a faith that's not based off of how good we are, how strong we believe, how uh, great we appear to be, but it's based off the work that you've already done. Help us to be the type of people who listen to questions because we have questions. Give us the patience to come alongside people who are making accusations of you because we've said similar things. Let us help in this time when we see people walking out the doors of the church to be willing to come alongside those people because we felt that temptation before as well. We are so grateful for your love, for your patience, for your grace in times of doubt and in times of great joy. It's to you and you alone we pray. Amen.